in life right now. <clears throat> All right. Uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, welcome back to Comp 3430 Operating Systems. In my office upstairs, it is 26 degrees right now. And so I was sitting in my office just like, I am not looking forward to coming into this room. I'm not looking forward to coming into this room, but it feels fine. I am really happy about that. I'm really, really happy about that. The AC in this building, they sent us an email last week to say like there's been going wrong with it and they just can't keep it running. And so when I was in my office and it's 26 and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to come to class if it's going to be 30 in here, I'm really happy that it's not. I hope that you all had a good weekend. Uh, today we're going to keep talking about file systems. We are running a little bit behind in terms of the weekly topics, uh, in terms of the way that they're scheduled. Um, but next week's topics, there's only one scheduled topic and I'm kind of like buffering there a little bit. So my plan for this week is to finish up with our file system stuff. I want to take a look at EXFAT one last time today um, and do an assessment on it and make some comparisons to what uh, VSFS and EXT look like. I want to look at file system consistency and file system resiliency. So we're going to be thinking about uh, file system checking, journaling, RAID. And then after that, we're going to move on to virtual memory. Uh, so that's going to be later this week. And then the rest of next week will just be virtual memory. Um, and if there's time, time permitting, uh, we'll spend a little bit of time doing review. I might also just set aside some time on Thursday's class next week. That'll be our last class. Uh, just generally for course questions. If there's any questions that you have about the course uh, or any questions that you have about the final exam, we can talk about that in that period of time. Uh, announcements otherwise, the final exam has been scheduled. Uh, the date is June 20th at 9 a.m. Don't, don't quote me on like that, like don't write it down. The registrar's office has a web page that you can go to, but that's that's the date that it was the last time I checked. They didn't say where it is. I'm not sure if they're waiting to book rooms until later or if I'm, we're just supposed to have the exam in this room. But when I know more, I'll let you know. I'll let you know. Uh, the seating situation will be assigned like the term test. That's, that's all I really want to say right now about the final exam in terms of where and when it is, because uh, I don't know where it is. But I know when it is, and uh, you should write that down in your calendars if, you, um, if you're thinking about it, if you're starting to think about it. Right, so uh, let's talk about file systems. I've got some learning outcomes here. I don't think we're going to have time to get to all of them today, and that's okay. Uh, but I want to give you a sense of where we're going in the next couple days. So by the end of today's and maybe tomorrow's lecture, you should be able to describe how a specific file system is implemented. This is ongoing or continuing. We're going to finish up looking at the EXFAT file system. We're going to finish up looking at how to assess some properties of the EXFAT file system. And we're going to go through the same kind of exercise, but I want to give you more of an opportunity to step through some of these questions yourself specifically in terms of looking at the documentation. So this is a real actual file system, so we can really actually answer some of these questions without having too many like hypotheticals. I want you to be able to show how common file operations are performed in terms of manipulating a file system's data structures. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, file system resiliency. And file system resiliency is one mechanism where we can show what changes are made to a file system's data structures as something is being manipulated or ever something is being changed. So when you're opening a file for modification, what data structures are being changed? And in this specific circumstance, what happens when the power goes out or we lose power or uh, the program that's writing to the file crashes? What happens in that case when we've got a partially updated file system? We'll look at RAID and I want you to be able to choose an appropriate RAID level given requirements. This is going to look like 
here's a contrived situation, here's a contrived person, here's the workload that they want to have, here are the constraints that they have, what RAID level should they pick for the disks that they've got? And then describe what a human operator might see in files when a file system is in an inconsistent state. So for this learning outcome and this learning outcome, how common file operations are performed in terms of manipulating a file system data structure, these are tied directly together today in terms of what we're talking about. So what you might see in your file explorer or in your image viewer or whatever you happen to be using when a file system is in an inconsistent state. All right, so first things first, I want to really quickly step through EXFAT again. I want to quickly step through this diagram specifically with relation to like building up cluster chains to find data in the file system get a sense of what the data structures are in EXFAT, and then start looking at those guiding questions and use the documentation to help us answer some of the, some of the questions. So let me pop this up. Uh, at the very beginning of our discussion on EXFAT, we were looking at the volume structure, the high-level volume structure of EXFAT. At the very beginning of the disk, at sector zero, there is exactly one sector. And in this one case, it is exactly 512 bytes in size. The data that's in there is exactly 512 bytes in size. Is this thing called the main boot sector. The main boot sector has metadata about the file system. This is the same general concept as the super block in VSFS and EXT. After the main boot sector, I'm basically going to say there's a bunch of stuff that is irrelevant to what we care about in this course. There are things that are important, like the checksum. The boot checksum is used to verify that the data structures that are there are valid, that they are correct based on what the checksum is, but we don't really care that much about it. There's the backup boot region, which is a complete duplicate of that entire first part of the primary boot region. And I want to motivate that. This kind of goes back to FAT, the original FAT file system that would go on floppy disks like that. When I was in elementary school, when I was in elementary school, this is mostly what we use. And then when I was in middle school and high school and then in university. When I was in university, we used to have to hand our assignments in on these. We'd like print out our source code, stick this into a folder, and then there'd be this bank of lockers downstairs that we'd, we'd stuff our assignments into. <laughs> Times have changed and I'm really happy about that. Uh, I'm gonna motivate why we have this backup boot region, why we've got this duplicate. And in VSFS EXT2, this is this whole idea of like stuff being scattered around the file system is also there. In VSFS and EXT2, we have super blocks kind of scattered around the entire disk. We've got groups of blocks that are scattered around the entire disk that have super blocks attached to them. I'm going to motivate that though with this disk. When I was a kid, when we would use these things, uh, this was a common thing we would do. Just like that, click, 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 click. But one of the things that you note about this is uh, there's just a small amount of the surface exposed on this. And when a kid would do stuff like that, you know, this disk is already bad, don't worry. It's already bad. When they'd start touching the surface of the disk, remember that this kind of goes around the whole disk. This is sector zero, and then eight more sectors, and sector, and sector, and sector. And then we've got a duplicate of that. And I'm kind of guessing, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not some kind of disk scientist here, but I'm kind of guessing that this is less than 12 sectors in size. So if I smash this with my finger, I may be able to turn this disk and get the next 12 sectors, which is the backup boot sector, uh, the backup of the boot region. We don't really do that much with like actual spinning platters drives. We don't open them up and stick our fingers on them, except when we're trying to make people cringe. Um, but still, the heads on those disks can crash into the surface of the platters and kind of ruin parts of it. So having that backup boot sector can be helpful for stuff like that. 
So the main thing that we really care about in the overall high level volume structure here is the main boot sector itself, which is 512 bytes. And for the purposes of your lab and for the purposes of your assignments, that has been provided to you so that you don't have to write all that stuff out. Uh, translating that table into a struct is tedious. Just have it, just use it. After all of that, the copy of the main boot region, we've got the fat region. And the FATS, the file allocation table here, this is the data structure that's being used to help us reconstruct files and reconstruct folders using a linked list. The linked list itself points to this data region or what's also referred to as the cluster heap. We're using the term clusters here. Every one of these clusters has one or more sectors in it, and it's, it's identical in concept to the idea of a block in the BSFS file system. The main boot sector has fields like how many bytes per sector there are, how many sectors per cluster there are, and really importantly, it tells you things like, what's the first cluster of the root directory? So I can start actually building up a cluster chain that corresponds to the root directory which in our worked example here was this E drive. We've got this E drive. The first cluster of this root directory in my E drive was cluster two. And then I went through the process of, we went through the process of building up a cluster chain, which is a linked list. The first cluster of root directory is two. So look at node two, look at entry two in the file allocation table. Look at what the value is and use that value as an index for the next thing that we're looking for. FFFFFFFF there says this is the end of cluster chain marker. So there's no more clusters in this chain. So you can stop building up your linked list. Once you've actually got that cluster chain, then you can move down to the cluster heap itself and start looking at the corresponding cluster numbers that you've got in your chain. So our first cluster of root directory here is two. That means that we can start immediately looking at cluster number two and start interpreting the contents of that cluster as a directory. A directory is filled with zero or more directory entry sets. And a directory entry set consists of at least three entries. A file directory entry that tells us what the type of the file is. So when you're looking at the documentation for this file directory entry, the type is in the file attributes property. There's a property in that directory entry called file attributes. And it tells you whether this file that is being referred to is a file or it is another directory. There's the stream extension directory entry. There's exactly one of these and it comes immediately after the file directory entry. This tells us where the first cluster of the cluster chain for this file is. And then after that, there's at least one file name entry. And the file name entries are just filled with the file name of what the file is or the directory is that we're looking at. There's at least one of these, and there can be many of them when we have file names that are more than 15 characters in size, more than 15 characters in size. There's also special entries. A directory entry that has a type of 00, zero here says there are no more directory entries, so you can stop scanning through this. There's nothing else to read. And then the other kinds of things that we've got are actual files. So in our root directory, there is an entry set here, file, stream extension, file name. And this entry set corresponds to hello.txt up there. The first cluster of hello.txt is a cluster four. We look at our file allocation table, build a cluster chain. It consists of exactly one cluster, which is cluster number four. And when we read cluster number four, it's the actual contents of the file in this case. So we've got a file there. It's got the actual contents of the file. There are other kinds of directory entries that I didn't talk about. This applies generally to the FAT family of file systems. They all work like this. So if you can do EXFAT, you can kind of go back to doing FAT32 or FAT12. There are other kinds of directory entries in EXFAT. Uh, one that's important for us is the uh, bitmap, uh, the allocation structure. And that tells us how many clusters are used 
uh, in the file system. There are these special directory entries appear only in the root directory. So when you are building up stuff that reads what uh, is in the root directory, you're going to find other kinds of directory entries, but it's only in the root directory. None of the other directories have those entries. So the root directory is going to have uh, the allocation structure directory entry that tells you where in the cluster heap that allocation structure is. It's also going to have a volume name uh, directory entry, which tells you what the name of the volume is, what it's been formatted is, when it was formatted. I don't include those in this diagram because they're not really part of like building up cluster chains and getting stuff out. All right, so I'm going to pause here for a second, give you a chance to ask questions if you have questions about rebuilding cluster chains, figuring out what's in a directory, getting files out of this file system. Uh, so the struct that I gave you corresponds to the main boot record. So when you are, I'm going to go to the documentation here. When you are starting to read your, um, when you're starting to read this file system, that struct corresponds to this table four. So starting at byte zero in the file, you can start reading byte zero in the file and you can read the next 512 bytes directly into that structure. That's going to tell you things like what's the volume length, where is the file allocation table, how big is it, where's the cluster heap, that sort of thing. This is just once. You just read this one time, and then to, to build the, the linked list of stuff, that's going through that file allocation table. And those are just 32 bytes, 32-bit uh, numbers. They're just 32-bit numbers that you're building a linked list out of. You're going to have to use LSeq a lot, yes, to move around between different parts of the volume. So when you start, you open the file, you'll read this structure. Then you're going to have to seek to the file allocation table to start doing stuff with the file allocation table once you know what the first cluster of the root directory is. Then you're going to have to seek to the cluster heap to find out what's actually in the first uh, cluster of the root directory to find out what directory entries are there. And then eventually, for the assignment, then you'll start moving around the cluster heap, starting to find out like what's the contents of files, because they're not all going to be at the beginning of the, of the cluster heap. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the question was, um, if there are no files, is there still a file allocation table? The file allocation table is just part of the EXFAT file system. So there's always going to be a file allocation table. Um, but even with no files, there's still a root directory. So if you have no files in a directory, it just you'll open it up in Explorer, and it will be empty. There will be nothing there. But there's still some part of the file system that describes what that empty directory is. OK, all right. So what I would like to do, if you've still got this set of uh, questions, please feel free to take out that piece of paper. I didn't print them again. I've also posted this up on the course web page. And I will leave this up here. The questions that I want to answer are just parts one and two. We're not going to go through all of these questions together, but I want to just answer parts one and two. In this case, I'm going to tell you that I want you to actually look at the documentation for EXFAT. So I'll leave these questions up here if you don't have a printout so you can see them. I want you to actually start looking through the documentation for EXFAT excuse me to start answering these questions. I'm going to remind you briefly that what's the largest file size that this file system can store? When we were answering this question about VSFS, uh, the 
this is a question that's masquerading as how many blocks can an inode point at? And then what's the block size? So how many inodes can I point at? What's the block size? We take the product of that. That tells us how big the biggest file is that this file system can store. What's the maximum size of a volume for this file system? And what's the maximum number of files that this file system can store? So how many things can we put into that file system? What's, what properties of the file system can you configure to change those values? There's actually not much you can change about EXFAT. There's really only one thing that you can change about EXFAT, which is the cluster size, how many sectors per cluster there are. So that's, that's the answer to that. Uh, you can only change how many sectors per cluster there are. So take the time to do this. I'm going to give you a few minutes for the first one and for the second one. The two places that I'm going to give you a hint about where to look is that you're going to need to look in that main boot record. That's where some of this information is. And the other place that you need to going to look is in the stream extension directory entry. That will give you some more information about where to find these values. I'm going to give you about three minutes. Feel free to work with the person next to you if you want. Feel free to talk to each other. Please ignore the children screaming next door. I don't know what's going on over there. School is not out yet. I don't know why there's kids on campus. It's not mini U. I don't know what's going on. If you're taking a class next term, be prepared for mini U. Many of you will be on next term. Uh, next term being like starting July 1, whatever the second half of the summer term is. Yeah. Anyway, three minutes. Please go ahead. And then we'll come back and we'll try to answer some of these questions together. Maybe we should go bang on the wall too. <laughs>
All right, let's, uh, let's work through these together. I'm going to, uh, I want to answer the second question first here. What's the maximum size of a volume for this file system? I'm going to pop open our documentation. And I'm going to be looking at this main and backup boot sector structure. And I want to just look at some of the fields that are in here to get a sense of what we could be using to calculate that. This is the metadata for our entire file system. And what's the biggest volume that we can address? It kind of makes sense that that's where this would be in the metadata for the entire file system itself. Jump boot by its name, it doesn't tell us much, uh, but please excuse me for a second. People listening on the stream are gonna hear what I'm saying next door. So I guess, hi, are we too loud? Yeah, Sorry. who's in charge here? Uh, hey, okay, where are they? Excuse me. Oh, you Hi, I'm running a class next door, and a bunch of your kids are banging on the wall. Thank you. Sorry. All right, well, that was a thrilling aside for today's lecture. The jump boot field doesn't really say much about how big this file system is based entirely on its name. This is kind of an artifact that tells us where, like, we're going to start booting a system up. Where do we start running code? Where do we actually start running code in this file system? The file system name, OK, it's going to tell us what it is. Must be 0. Must be 0. It's not going to tell us much. Partition offset, maybe. Volume length, OK, that looks like an ideal candidate for what we could use to figure out how big this volume can be. So let's take a look at that. The volume length field, it is an option of at least 2 to the 20 divided by 2 to the power of bytes per sector shift. Remember those shift named fields, those are uh, named that way because you can calculate powers of two by shifting one to the left. Two to the power of bytes per sector shift is the same as one shifted by that many, that many spaces, that many spaces. So that's the smallest volume that's no less than one megabyte. And at most, 2 to the 64 minus 1, which is the largest value that this field can describe. So this field is a 64-bit number. And then, however, if the size of the excess, excess space subregion is 0, then the largest value of this field is this calculation. This is telling us I don't want to have a bigger volume than there are clusters in the cluster heap. So if there's no extra space at the end, I don't want to have more in this volume than there are clusters in the cluster heap. This is a good candidate to tell us how big this volume can be. But unfortunately, it's not the actual number that we want. 2 to the 64 minus 1 is a huge number. This is exabytes. I think this is getting into exabytes, which is bigger than the volumes can be in a ex fat formatted file system so let's go back to the main boot region the main boot records main boot sector volume length is an excellent candidate for what it could be but this doesn't tell us how big the volume can actually be in terms of what other constraints that we have fat offset and fat length that tell us uh, where the fats are in the file system and how big they are Cluster heap offset tells us where the cluster heap starts. Cluster count tells us how many clusters there are in this file system. The cluster count here 
is some number that's the lower bounds. And then 2 to the 32 minus 11, which is the maximum number of clusters a batch can describe. OK, that is an actual upper bound that we want on this, which is significantly smaller than 2 to the 64 minus 1. 2 to the 32 minus 11, which is the maximum number of clusters that a fat can describe. That's how many clusters we can point at 2 to the 32 minus 11. The other half of this then is a cluster is something that consists of one or more sectors. So how big can a cluster actually be? The, how big a cluster can be gets us to uh, bytes per sector shift and sectors per cluster shift. Serial number doesn't help us. Vo file system revision doesn't help us. Volume flags doesn't really help us. If we take a look at this, uh, one thing that we can see right away down here is that the bytes per sector shift, which evaluates to a cluster size of 32 megabytes, is the maximum size of a cluster. So the number of clusters that we can refer to in the file system in its entirety, and this is different from how many clusters or how many blocks can an inode point at, because we're saying that this is how many entries the FATs can have. We're not talking about individual files right now. We're talking about the entire file system can address this many entries in the FATs. So 2 to the 32 minus 11 times 32 megabytes gets us a good enough answer, but we can actually answer this question by saying two, 2 to the 32 minus 11 times uh, 32 megabytes. So there's 1024 megabytes per kilobyte, 1024 kilobytes per byte. 1.44 times 10 to the 17, which is something like 128 petabytes, I believe. And I'm going to confirm that by looking up the most reputable source on the internet. The Wikipedia page for EXFAT and the max volume sizes by 128 petabytes, which is what corresponds to the number that we just calculated. So we can address this many clusters in the FAT, not per file, but in the FAT. And then that times the cluster size tells us how big this file system can be. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Petabytes. Yeah, this 10 to the 17 number is in bytes. If I were to ask you a question like this on a final exam, I would not ask you to simplify this expression, to be clear. I'm not going to get you to bring a calculator, so I wouldn't ask you to simplify this number to 10 to the 17. It would be more like, show me the expression, what these numbers are coming from. I would also give you the important numbers that you need to know if I were to ask you a question like this, because I don't expect you to have printed out the EXFAT documentation to bring it with you to the DTAM. So if I were to ask a question like that, you'd have all the information you need, and I would ask you not to simplify the expression. I don't care what the actual number is. OK, so I want to go back to the other question now. What is the largest file size that this file system can store? Are there any, did anybody figure this out? Do we have any guesses based on what I just showed on the Wikipedia page, if you saw it? It's not an exabytes. The maximum volume size is petabytes. Siri, what is an exabyte? Is that what just happened there? <laughs> it's not an exabytes. The biggest size for this volume is in petabytes. So the biggest size of the file system is 128 uh, petabytes, petabytes. And that's the number of clusters that we can address times 32 megabytes, which is the maximum cluster size. We just counted what the maximum size of the volume is by figuring out how many clusters we can address times the cluster size. The way that we're figuring out what's in a file in this file system is by building a cluster chain. 
the biggest file in this file system is a cluster chain that starts at two and just goes to the end. It takes the whole thing. It takes the entire file system up. There's just one file in the root directory, and it's this one massive file that takes the whole file allocation table up. And if we think about it that way, it's this one file that sits in the root directory that takes the entire file allocation table. The biggest file that we can address in this file system is basically the same thing. It's basically the same thing as the biggest volume size. The biggest volume is how many clusters we can address. The biggest file is what's the biggest number of clusters that we can put into one single file, and it's the entire cluster chain, the entire fat. Yeah. It would start with cluster two, right? Like this hypothetical, like really large. Yeah. Thing. Remembering that uh, cluster two is actually cluster zero, is the zeroth entry in our array of clusters because this is a two based array. <laughs> because this is a two based array. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Is there an actual need for a file that's close to that size? Not that I'm aware of. There are definitely files, individual files that are in the terabyte size. Those exist. I, I mean, I don't know much about the scale of Google and Meta and Alphabet and whatever. Maybe they have a file that's that big. I, I doubt it, but maybe they do, yeah? The US government. The US government. This, the, the NSA has that stream of data, yes. Ah, okay, so that's a good question. I'm gonna take this calculator entry here and I'm gonna copy it and I'm gonna put it into um, this document. So this is, Oh, how can I put this so that it doesn't make it look like it's part of the expression? I'm going to put it in square brackets. Square brackets are what I'm getting these terms from. So this is 2 to the 32 minus 11. Uh, that number is 2 to the 32 minus 11. This 1024 is um, megabytes, kilo, kilobytes per megabyte, because this is times uh, 32... 32 megabytes uh, max cluster size. And I'm trying to convert this from megabytes down into bytes. So the first 1024 is kilobytes per megabyte. The second 1024 is bytes per kilobyte. So then the units, the unit for this whole thing is bytes. All right, so I'm gonna skip down here. I'm gonna skip this. What's the maximum number of files this file system can store? And I'm gonna get you to think in terms of, compare this to VSFS. With VSFS, the maximum number of files that we could store was how many inodes can we have? We've just calculated a bunch of stuff based on file allocation table. We've got this idea that cluster chains and clusters are what files have. So try to think about what the relationship is here between these two things. VSFS is just the maximum number of inodes that we can have. We don't have inodes in this file system, but there is something that kind of relates to that, especially with relationship to the cluster chain idea and how one file maps to at least one cluster in our file system. I'm going to scroll down here, and I'm going to look at these two uh, wasted space questions. So how much space is wasted by the file system on metadata? I'm going to pop over to my diagram here. How much space is wasted by metadata? We can answer that actually in uh, sectors here. 
This is going to be that entire main boot region plus the size of the copy of the main boot region plus the size of the file allocation tables. In terms of like, I've got a 512 gigabyte disk, 30 sectors is not very much. It's a tiny fraction of space. There's not much space that's wasted by metadata. As we did with VSFS, we can answer this also in terms of how much space is allocated to things like directory structures. The file system in our case here is using the cluster heap to store directory metadata. All of our file names and stuff, they're in the cluster heap. So every directory that we have has at least one cluster. To have a single file, we must have at least the root directory. We have to have a root directory. We have to put something in the root directory to have that file be present. So it's a little bit of a waste here to say that we have this directory metadata in the file system, but VSFS did the same thing. It does the same thing. It puts all the directory, directory relationships between inodes and names in the block in the data region. So there is a little bit of loss here. There's a little bit of waste in terms of metadata in the file system itself. The other questions that we've got here is how much space is wasted by very large files and how much is wasted by very small files? The answer here is the same kind of answer as with VSFS. With VSFS, we had we've gone back too far. With VSFS, we had this problem where if I've got this picture of my cat and it only takes part of a block, the rest of the block is kind of wasted. If I have something that's one byte in size, the entire rest of the block is wasted. EXFAT has the same problem, an identical problem. If we have a file that is one byte, the rest of the cluster is allocated to that one file with one byte, and it can't be used for anything else. If it's only partially used, we can't use it for anything else. How much space is wasted by very large files? With VSFS, we were losing space by using blocks for indirect pointers and doubly indirect pointers. Not a lot compared to the actual size of the file, but we were losing space to that. With EXFAT, we don't really lose that space because all of that is kept in the cluster chain, in the FAT, in the file allocation table. We don't have extra metadata that is this giant tree structure embedded inside of our cluster heap. Everything is kept in the file allocation table. So in this one case, for very large files, there's less space wasted by EXFAT than there is with VSFS. Wasted again, like necessary for metadata. One last thing I want to point at um, to give you a sense of where to look for uh, metadata for VSFS, uh, specifically about this, uh, this question, what's the maximum file size? I kind of just hand wave this. It's just the same as the FAT. Um, let's take a look at the documentation again for this. And there's a couple of things that I want to point at specifically. And I'm going to go to the top so that I can get my index here. We've got three directory entries per file for uh, EXFAT, for files that are in a directory. We've got three entries. There's the file that tells us what kind of thing it is. There's the file name, which is the file name. And then there's the stream extension, which tells us where we can find the start of the file. This is where the first cluster of the cluster chain is. I want to take a look at these directory entry definitions, and I want to look at the stream extension directory entry. The stream extension directory entry has the first cluster. This is where we can find the first cluster of the chain for this specific file or folder but it also tells us what the size of this file is, how many bytes are in this file in the data length fields. 
That's necessary because we might have something that's less than a cluster in size, so it might not take up the whole cluster. The data length field is a value that is 8 bytes in size here. So that's 32 bits. So we could kind of guess similar to what the volume length field was. We could guess that that's the biggest file that this thing can have in it. And that's a good place to look. The other place that you need to look, and this is kind of a hint for when you're getting to the assignment. In the stream extension, there's also this general secondary flags entry. And if we take a look at this section 7.6.2, this tells us that it conforms to the generic secondary directory entry template. This is good documentation, but you're jumping around a lot in sometimes some places. So we'll go to section 6.4.2. Within this field, this is a bit field that tells us about properties of this stream extension. There is this no fat chain entry in the field name. The no fat chain field here shall have the same definition as the same name field in the generic primary directory entry, uh, which says that we don't actually allocate a cluster chain for this file because all the clusters are right next to each other. So you don't have to rebuild a cluster chain for this file if it has the no fat chain bit set. You can just use the cluster uh, the, the data length from the stream extension and just read all of it. You don't have to jump around between, um, between clusters. No fat chain also means there is no fat chain for this. So if you try to build a fat chain, you might not actually get a valid fat chain for, for this thing that you're trying to read. All right. OK, I'm going to stop. Drink a bit of water. It's quieted down a lot over there. I think they left. OK. At this point, I think we're going to, we're going to move on to talking about RAID. Um, we're going to move on to talking about RAID. I'm going to uh, spend some time on Monday next week or later this week. I'll, maybe I'll let you decide that if you want it sooner than later. But uh, spend some time on Monday next week talking about the assignment, about assignment one. But uh, you, should, you should be able to do the whole assignment at this point. Uh, with this document and with what you did in lab one, you've got open, read, LSEQ. You've got data structures that you can build. You should effectively be able to do the assignment in its entirety at this point. Yeah. You should be able to do the whole thing, yeah. The trickiest part of this assignment is moving around the file and knowing where you are in the file. Uh, there are other like weird things that I've tried to mark in the assignment document itself, like this is a two-based array instead of a zero-based array. Um, but for the most part, you should be able to, to do it. Yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, this file is like I've met up on the last assignment last week, and I'm just kind of behind on file system. So it's yeah. It's the best place to do it. Uh, it's like three games looking at the last like, That's a fair question. What's the best way to get caught up? If your focus is on the lab and the assignment, don't read the textbook. Because uh, <laughs> the textbook doesn't tell you about EXFAT. When you're thinking about the final exam, read the textbook. But when you're focusing on the assignment of the lab, uh, that is entirely in class. So last class, we stepped through EXFAT, building up cluster chains, all that stuff. Uh, this class, we're looking at properties of EXFAT, trying to answer some questions about it. But uh, it's EXFAT is entirely in class. There's no textbook entries about that. If you want to remind yourself about like the system calls that you need to make for working with binary files, 
Uh, some of those are documented in the textbook. If you don't know about how folder structures work, that's in the textbook, but I'm pretty sure we all know how folder structures work. I think that's a reasonable assumption to make. Yeah, yeah, uh, folder structures, yeah, like open the C drive and double click on it and just see how folders descend, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the, the EX fat stuff is entirely stuff that we've done in class. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Mostly about locking? <laughs> for the final exam or for the assignment? There's, there's tons of threading and locking in the file system assignment, yeah. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm completely joking. You, your, your file system code should not deadlock. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, I have to be really honest. Uh, I'm digressing, I'm really digressing. When I was thinking about assignments for this term, I was thinking like, hmm, maybe I should do a multi-threaded file system assignment and how do you do like write support for a file system? And then I decided that was a bad idea and didn't follow through with that. Uh, but I was kind of getting to the point of like, okay, well, here's what the open file table would look like and here's how your threads would try to get access to that open file table because the open file table itself would have to be locked for all the different threads that you've got. But I didn't do it, I didn't. I stopped myself and I didn't do it. There's no, there's no threads or locking. Uh, assignment two is easily the most difficult assignment. Yes. This assignment is straightforward. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's easy. It is straightforward. The documentation is comprehensive. Building linked lists is 2140 and 2160 stuff. The hardest part of this is uh, like knowing where you are in the file system. So using seek effectively, actually writing down on paper, what are the expressions that I need to use to calculate? How do I get to this cluster in the first place to start reading data from it? Knowing that you're actually reading a directory and not a file when you're doing it, doing bit manipulation. Those are the hard things for this assignment. There isn't a lot of conceptual difficulty. The other hard part about this is recursion. Everybody hates recursion for some reason. I hated recursion. I will honestly tell you that I did not understand recursion until I took the programming languages course, uh, which is not offered anymore, which I lament. Uh, that was a third year course. So I was like second half of third year that I'm just like, oh, that's what recursion is. It took me a long time to figure that out. I did computer science in high school. It took me a long time to figure out what recursion was and what it actually meant. And I'm not sure that I could explain it to you right now. Anyway. Yeah, yes. Don't ask me about recursion, please. <laughs> Which data structures will be changed when you add files to EXFAT? And delete them. Ah, okay. That's a good question. I'm going to. I'm going to answer that really quickly, um, but I'm also going to say that I'm going to answer this in the form of a Kahoot, so, um, so we'll just do it twice. We'll do it twice. We've got file system manipulation system calls. We've got open, read, and write. Those are the three that I want to talk about right now. With open, we're passing a path to the code that is then going to interpret like what do you actually want to open? What file are you trying to open? The file system data structures that are going to be used in EXFAT to figure that out are the main boot sector. The main boot sector has the first cluster of root directory. That's how we build, start building a cluster chain. If I'm trying to open, for example, image.jpg here, if I'm trying to open this file for read, I'm going to have to read the main boot sector to find out what the first cluster of the root directory is. I'm gonna to have to open and then read the file allocation table, the FAT, to traverse it, to build up the directory entries for the root directory 
then I'm going to have to go to the cluster heap itself. Then I have to go back to the cluster chain. So I have to build the directory entries for my root directory to find directory. Then I have to build the cluster chain for directory start at the, starting at the fat using the stream extension. And then I'm going to have to find the things that are in directory and then check to see if that image.jpg exists, build a cluster chain for that, and then read it from the heap itself. If I'm making changes to a file, so if I'm deleting something from a directory, I have to delete the directory entries for the file. So if I wanted to say remove hello.txt, I would have to remove the directory entries from this directory, from the cluster heap. I would have to modify with actual exfat, so not just what we've got here, but I'd also have to modify that allocation structure. There's a bitmap that says which clusters are used and which are unused. I'd have to make changes to that. And then in the main boot sector, there's a percent and use field that I have to update if it changes. Percent is a very, very coarse grained number compared to the clusters that we have. So it might not actually change. It might still be 19% in use if I just deleted one cluster from, from this directory structure. If I'm appending to a file, I'm going to have to do the same thing. I have to update that allocation structure. I have to modify the file, file allocation table. I have to maybe add new clusters to this file, depending on whether or not I've gone past the bounds of a cluster for it. And I also have to modify the cluster heap to be able to make changes to, to extend an existing file. If I'm appending, the main boot sector might be changed if the percent in use changes, but the rest of it wouldn't change. All right. So. Let's go back to slides here. I want to start talking about RAID. We've got file systems. And the change that I want to make now is to not just talking about the details of file systems, but I want to talk about the data that we're actually putting on the drive. So like I'm writing files to this. I want to make sure that the data that I am writing to my drive is reliable. I want to make sure that I can actually read it back in the long term. I also want to talk eventually about file system consistency. File system consistency and data are two different things. File system consistency is about the data structures in the file system. We've got many data structures in our file system that tell us different things about what's on the file system. If they disagree with each other, so if I went through and found all of the stream extensions in my directories and I added up all of the values for the length of the data, or if I use that allocation structure and I compare it to the percent and use fields, that's an inconsistent file system if they don't agree with each other. But it doesn't tell us anything about the data that's actually on the drive. RAID is a mechanism that we can use to take many drives and then try to do different things with them, like RAID 0 called striping. And RAID 0 striping says, take a bunch of disks, a bunch of disks like this. These are not four terabyte disks, but they are a bunch of disks. Take a bunch of them, stitch them together like this. And then we're going to do two parts to this at the same time. Plug them all into this thing. This is a RAID controller. This is an ancient RAID controller. I'm not sure if you recognize this type of cable that's on here, but these are called IDE cables. This comes before NVMe. This comes before serial ATA. This is a RAID controller. We plug this thing in to, I'm going to pop this up here. I'm going to show OBS. I'm going to switch to my full camera. This is our RAID controller here. We plug this part into the main board of the system. So this is a PCI card. This is a PCI card, which is just their slots that we can plug in this card into our system. And then we've got these IDE headers on this extension card. What this does is this will show our operating system 
that there is one disk attached to this system. Regardless of how many things we've attached to these headers, this device will show our operating system that there is one single disk attached to the system. The operating system is going to send read commands. It's going to send write commands. It's going to ask for sectors. It's going to ask for tracks. It's going to ask for whatever it needs. And then this chip here, this is our actual RAID controller. This will translate those sector requests into which device is this byte or read or sector actually mapped to, which one is it actually on. It will send the request to the drive. The drive will send the data back to the controller. The controller will send the data back to the operating system. The OS doesn't know that there's maybe a bunch of disks attached to this. RAID 0 striping says, I'm going to take these disks, plug them in here. Wouldn't recommend you normally do this. I'm going to plug them into my system here, plug them in. They are attached to my controller card here. This, if these are two terabyte drives with RAID 0, this would just look like one big four terabyte drive take both of their drives, add their capacity together. You've got a big drive. You've got a bigger drive than you had originally. The problem with this is oh no, my drive failed. I can't get any data off this. I can't get data off this now. RAID 1 is mirroring. So RAID 0 stripe. Just take all your disks, add their capacities together. My RAID controller does the job of figuring out which drive, physical drive, a request belongs to. RAID 1 is mirroring. I'm going to take the disks that I've got, and assuming that they are the same size, oh, this isn't even an IDE drive. Uh, Assuming that they are the same size, plug this in the right way. Assuming that they are the same size now, I don't need to put the big screen up here, I don't think anymore. Assuming that they're the same size, the RAID controller, the operating system sends request in for write. The RAID controller says, all right, thank you, and it sends the same write request to all drives that are attached. Every drive has a full copy of everything. But the problem with this is if this is a two terabyte drive and this is a two terabyte drive, our RAID controller says, you have a two terabyte drive attached to this, even though there's many attached to it. The benefit of that is, oh no, I've lost my drive. You can still recover all of your data because it's on this drive. Everything is on this drive. You lose the capacity, but you have duplicates of it. RAID 4 and 5 try to balance both of these things. Striping make it really big, but the risk of losing data is very high. RAID 1 lose all that extra space, but the risk of losing data becomes close to zero as you add more drives to the system. RAID 4 and 5 try to do something that's balancing between the two of them. I've got three disks that are attached to this. I can't actually physically attach three disks to this, but I'm going to say pretend. Please pretend for me here. The OS sends a write request to our controller here. The controller says, OK, I will make that write request. I'm going to send it to one of these two drives that are attached, but I'm also going to send a request to this drive. I'm going to calculate across these two drives, across the same approximate location, what's the checksum for this? I'm going to calculate a parity bit. I'm going to take this one disk, and this will just be full of parity bits and nothing else. That means that if I take this drive, these two drives, and I XOR that data, and I get the result of the XOR, and I put it on this one. I've got two disks here. They're two terabytes each, four terabytes here. There's an eight, a four terabyte drive attached to this thing. 
oh no, I've lost one of my drives, I can recalculate what that is when I jam another drive into this system because I know what the XOR is. XOR of 0 and 1 is 1, so the other thing that's not on this drive had to be a 0 or a 1. Kind of reverse the XOR that we've got there. RAID 0, give me all the space, but I've got high risk, I might lose my data. RAID 1, not much space, but there's very little chance of me losing data from this thing. RAID 4 or 5 tries to balance those two things together. Give me more space, but give me some flexibility in terms of being able to lose one of those disks. The difference between 4 and 5 here, and this is all in the textbook, the difference between, the difference between 4 and 5 here, excuse me, is that 4 says this is the parity drive, 5 says let's rotate across the drives where the parity bit goes. Let's do a quiz. The network is real slow here today. Pizza Pops is back. Loud children. Just the eyeballs is really a little bit disconcerting here. Okay. <laughs> well, hold here for just another five seconds or something. All right. So the first question in this quiz is about file systems. The rest of the questions are about RAID. Okay, so we're kind of balanced pretty evenly between BSFS and EXFAT here. This number that I picked, less than 15 blocks or clusters, was an intentionally selected value. And the intention of picking this thing that's less than 15 or some small number of values is that in VSFS, this is close to the number of direct block pointers that we've got. Assuming that I know where the inode is in the inode table, so I've got an inode that corresponds to a file, or I know the first cluster of the file, reading a file from VSFS, I've got the struct for the inode, I have all the direct block pointers, I can just immediately start reading data for that file, just follow the direct block pointers to the data region. With exfat, in terms of fat, the way that we know about it, if I have the first node or the first cluster of that file, I have to build a cluster chain. I have to go through the process of building a linked list to be able to get the data out of that thing. So for very small files, for reading or for writing, VSFS and EXT would be faster because if we can constrain it all within a single inode, I don't have to build up a big data structure to be able to get to the data that I've got. We okay with that? Yeah, okay. Pizza Pops.
Aw, oh, nobody wanted to pick for the regular arguments on identifying dolphins. They are, these are both correct. Uh, redundant array of independent disks. We have an a, array of independent disks here. They are redundant, possibly, especially with RAID 1, where we literally have redundancy between the two drives. Redundant array of independent, inexpensive disks. Buying four drives of a smaller size can be cheaper than buying one big drive. Sometimes. That's not always the case now. That's not always the case now, but when RAID was first conceived of, that was definitely the case. It was cheaper to buy four, four 200 megabyte disks than one, one, ter one gigabyte disk. Oh my god. Scale here. Hundreds of megabytes versus gigabytes. Now we're talking about like 20 terabyte drives. Okay. Okay, good, good. So, the things that we're asking about with RAID, the performance metrics that we're using to try and determine how good or bad, I've broken this, it kept dropping onto the floor and I broke it. Uh, the measurements that we wanna take are performance, how fast can we read or write? So, with something like RAID 0 and RAID 1, reading is pretty fast because we can distribute reads across these disks. How reliable are they? Well, RAID 0, we've already figured out. We throw the disk on the floor and we can't get any data back. RAID 1, we can fully recover data. Capacity, RAID 0, if I add these things up together versus RAID 1 where I get the biggest disk size that I've got. Density, how many bits can I pack into this physical area, is the one thing that is not a measurement of this. This is a question of how densely can I pack this drive? That's what this is asking. How densely can I pack this drive? How close together can I get the bits and the magnets and stuff? That's different from capacity, which is how many bytes can I get out of this entire array of things? You're not convinced. I can't tell if you're convinced or not. Okay, okay, good. You're convinced now. So density, how many bits can I pack into this area? That's how many bits can I get on a single drive? Capacity, how many bytes can I get across all of these drives? Okay. Pizza Pop has fallen off. Okay, good. We've got our three drives here. This is our parity drive. We're calculating parity by doing XOR. XOR of this one and this one gives us the results. If we lose just the parity drive, and this sounds weird, like can we lose the parity drive and still recover the data? Well, if we lose the parity drive, the data is still here. The data is still here. If we plug in a new drive, we can recalculate the parity and put it all on that new disk that we put in. If we lose this drive in the middle, if we lose this drive in the middle, we can recalculate that if we still have the parity drive. We can plug a new drive in and just calculate that XOR again and get that data back. With RAID 4, 
we can lose a drive, assuming we have it set up this way, and still get our data back. We can still get our data back. This question, can we lose the parity drive? The parity part of this is a red herring. This is like, hey, look at this, but it's actually irrelevant. It's can we lose a drive and still get data back out of it? Pizza Pops is back on the top, sorta. I believe that is a different set of children screaming next door now. I hope this is not throughout the rest of the week. Good. Rate zero. We cannot recover the data. If we lose it, it's gone. We can't get it back. Raid one, we've got duplicates. We can definitely recover the data because we can just take it off of one of the duplicates. Special file systems like ZFS will allow us to get our data back possibly the most correct answer here is is raid one in terms of the stuff that we're looking at but special file systems like zfs can allow us to be able to get data back because they themselves are behaving kind of like raid controllers on top of a bunch of disks here's the last question It's totally okay if this is just a guess. Okay. Okay, okay. So Journaling, file system checking, these are two approaches to uh, dealing with file system consistency. And this is kind of different from the other questions that we've just had about RAID. RAID is more about the data that's on drives. These drives do not know about file systems. They just have data on them. This is about file system consistency. File system checking and journaling are two approaches to dealing with file system consistency. Journaling is write your data in one spot and then write it again to make sure that you have a consistent file system, make changes to it, stage changes before you actually commit those changes. And file system checking is, rather than wasting time while you're writing, just wait until after it's happened and then try to figure out what's wrong with your file system. So just make changes to something and then after the, the problem has happened, try to fix it. When would you choose journaling? Journaling is this strategy of make your changes in one place and then try to uh, copy those changes to make sure that you have a consistent file system. This is a write expensive operation. If you only write once, the cost of that duplicated write is kind of negligible. If you're constantly writing to your file system, that write operation can be very, very expensive over the long term. All right, let's see who's the big winner and then uh, I'm grateful that you're giving me a couple of extra minutes of your time. Congratulations, Brett. All right. Yeah, yeah. Great job, Brett. OK, so uh, I'm going to pop over here. What we're going to do tomorrow is take a look at some example situations. I've posted these on the course web page. I'll hand them out in class tomorrow. but. If you want to get a sense of what we're looking at tomorrow, go ahead and read them in advance. I won't take them down. We're going to look at these scenarios and try to decide which RAID is the best RAID for that situation. Different RAID servers, ugh, different RAID levels serve different needs. Inconsistent file systems look different to regular. Oh God, they look different. I don't know what I'm trying to say by that statement. Different ways that file systems can be inconsistent will look different to regular humans. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. We'll get to that later. Thank you all for your time, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye, everybody.